you know, you can see worse we have had that time, but she probably got her turn. <laughs> Brother Charlie? Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for looking over to take care of us. And Father, realize that you're in control of all this weather and things. And we put our faith and our trust in you. And Father, we pray tonight for all the nations that's under these storm watches that got going on. That you will look at it and you will take care of them and bless them, Father, this day. Father, we thank you tonight for the privilege that we have that we can come together to worship you in the spirit of truth. Open our minds and our hearts tonight for thy words and thy teaching, Father. And Father, we pray tonight for all those that are burdened with heavy burdens. And Father, we pray tonight that you'll bring a spiritual revival to our nation that will turn back to seek God, not Satan. Father, we thank you, Son, Jesus Christ, who gave it all for us, Father. For his name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> We are ready for Matthew 23 and beginning at verse 13. Uh, we're looking at Beware the Leaven of the Pharisees. We're letting Jesus speak to us as we have for several weeks now. He reveals things to us that we would not otherwise know. He says things to them that we would not have known to say. And um, I am using an approach that I discovered many, many years ago to lay the Beatitudes alongside the woes that are given in Matthew 23. And they are evenly contrasted and it makes for an interesting uh, analysis for us. Uh, Matthew 23, verse 13, the first of those woes, he says, What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You won't go in yourselves, and you won't let others enter either. And the first of the Beatitudes is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, don't you see a contrast there? A poor in spirit, you're, you're, you think less of self, you're aware of others, you're certainly wanting to be proper before God, you're wanting to enter the kingdom, and you're told that the poor in spirit will inherit the kingdom. And he tells us something that we could have suspicioned if we lived in that time. But we could not say these words with absoluteness because he says to them, you will not enter in. And this is the Son of God who's making that statement. And so he's telling them, look at yourself. You're shutting the door to the kingdom for people around you. Now how would, how would someone do that? It's not actual shutting a door, so it's by their words or their actions. And I think we can fall prey to that also. If the way we treat people, the way that we act toward them in different ways, home or even here, they don't want anything to do with us. And in a way, you are helping to shut the door to the kingdom because they lose interest because of things you might say or do. And of course, the Pharisees were much stronger than that. I'm applying it to us that we need to be people who are, who are poor in spirit and we're opening the doors with our words and our attitudes to other people. Encourage them to be here. Encourage them to be a part of whatever we're about. Classes, worship, VBS, a picnic somewhere in the park, whatever might be done. Uh, 
when we make it worse for people to come and be a part of us, and I'm talking not about doctrine, but our attitudes or actions, we could shut the door to the kingdom for them as well because they no longer would have interest. Um, I have been spending about a month getting ready to preach from the book of Romans and some of the things that we will need to say from Romans chapter 1 about the upside down nature of sexuality and men and men and women and women and all the things that are part of that verb, a part of that chapter. I've been reminded that it's a PG-13 theme. So I'm not going to teach the heart of that message during worship when we have younger people here. But I'm going to preach the text in class when it's for adults. But I have found two presenters who've spoken on that subject in recent years and they made the observation that in both times, people stood up and left when they preached that message. But they did not apologize for it because it's something from God's word that needs to be preached. And of course, I'm going to do that. And uh, when you talk about the wrath of God, some people are offended by that. The wrath of God is being stored up against those who no longer choose to retain the knowledge that's revealed to them. People don't want to hear that. But it needs to be presented from God's word in the right way. Love, patience, letting people have information so perhaps they can make changes in their life. And when you come to these verses... We need to not see Jesus as an angry person in telling this to the Pharisees. We don't need to see him as being vindictive. We need to see him as speaking truth in love so they would have a chance to change, to be different in their actions, to no longer be hypocritical. And so how it's presented matters. Someone's willingness to hear it matters. I'm, I'm reminded of John chapter 6. In the early section of that very long chapter, Jesus essentially talks to a group of followers. They're called disciples in John 6, 66. But they're not the 12. They're just, they're interested listeners interested learners it's not the 12 apostles it's just disciples and he told them that unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood you have no part of me and he was essentially highlighting their lack of seriousness and their willingness to hold on they just got fed 5,000, 4,000 men plus women and children. And he wanted them to follow him for the right reason. And when he said those words, I have no doubt in my mind that he said it in the right way, with the right tone of voice, that he said it with the right body language, if you will, and that he said it because he cared about them. And yet John 6, 66, from that time forward, many disciples no longer followed him. And whose fault was that? If you were to determine a fault, whose fault was it that from that time forward, many disciples no longer followed him? There's only two answers it would be the followers who had interest but they did not want to hear that they did not want to change they were their shallowness was pointed out 
But did Jesus hesitate to say it? Because he cared about them, he couldn't. Because he wanted them to be more serious, follow for the right reason, he taught them the truth in a loving way. I'm convinced of that. And he wanted them to make changes in their response to him. And from that time forward, many disciples no longer followed him. And remember, it's not the 12, it's just listeners, learners, just individuals that were part of probably a larger group at that time. So what's said, why it's said, how it's said matters, but sometimes we can do a better job so as not to shut the door of the kingdom metaphorically, which this verse suggests to the Pharisees. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5 verse 3, and contrast it with Matthew 15, uh, Matthew 13, when he said, uh, Matthew 23, I'm sorry, Matthew 23, when he says, you're shutting up the kingdom. You're shutting up the kingdom because of what you're saying and doing. Comments or questions? Verse 11 and 12 point out before he even started. Yeah, go ahead and read it. Okay. okay. But he that is greater among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Yeah. Attitude matters, doesn't it? What is humility? It's thinking little of self. Some define it as thinking less of self, and that's not untrue. But to me, the better definition is thinking little of self and being mindful of others. You know, I heard something down the top of it. It says humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank I you. Somebody else say not taking yourself so seriously. Not taking yourself so seriously. Uh, the Word of God humbles us because right. we know how we just can't measure up. Being in the presence of Christ should have humbled the Pharisees right. to see what he did, miracles, to see the authority by which he spoke, to see the number of people responding to him should have humbled them. But the first of these woes, he says, you're shutting up the kingdom. You're shutting up the kingdom. You yourselves won't go in, and you don't let others enter either. And uh, that's quite a statement that only Christ could have made, knowing their hearts. Knowing their hearts. The... Second, woe, verse 14, is contrasted with the second of the Beatitudes. Matthew 5, verse 4, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Uh, it's telling us that God is involved in our life and whatever the reason for the mourning isn't even being discussed is the fact that someone is in mourning. And the Beatitude says there, there's a blessing there for those who mourn. You will be comforted. And the implication is what? That it comes from God. It's a comfort that God provides. So the mourning can bring about possible comfort. Now there's all kinds of directions you should go there, but it's not the point. Uh, if people don't admit sin in their life and don't mourn over that sin, but that's an application that's not the main point. If you don't care about people and aren't involved in their lives and don't know that something tragic has happened, 
That's an application, perhaps, but it's not the main point. The main point is, as we are brought to mourning, there is comfort. Just generally, straight out, there's comfort. And it would remind us that God is very aware of our circumstances and will provide what we need. What does he say to them? Verse 14. <coughs> Let me look here. Yes, I need to read verse 14 because it's not in the original manuscript. And I am using a different text tonight and it's not noted where I would normally have seen it. Verse 13 in the original manuscripts adds verse 14. What sorrow awaits you teaches of religious law and you Pharisees. You shamelessly cheat widows out of their property and then pretend to be pious by making long prayers in public. Because of this, you will be severely punished. And so instead of being those who would relate to mourners who need comfort, the Pharisees were taking advantage of the widows. And in taking advantage of them, they were even allowing property to be taken. And they were abusing their position and causing hardship to those who needed assistance. They needed someone to come and be helpful to them. Um, the reality is, well, let me let's read uh, Mark 12, verse 40. In my notes, I said there is a companion comment, and let's go see it. Mark 12, verse 40. Verse 40, they shamelessly cheat widows out of their property and then pretend to be pious by making long prayers in public. And because of this, they will be more severely punished. The rendering is in the Gospels. <clears throat> Matthew's account didn't cover it, but it was something that was said. It was something Jesus said. And so it's put alongside here as a footnote to make the necessary point. Uh, what is the Paul's instruction to Timothy about widows? Do we ignore them? No. Widows and orphans. Widows and orphans is, is one of the marching orders James would tell us for Christianity and awareness of those who need help. The widows and orphans are mentioned in James' writing. Paul spoke of a time in the first century when cities or congregations, same thing, the church at Galatia, the church at Corinth, the church at Thessalonica, they would have a widow's list. And we're given, we won't go there, but you can go look at it. We're given a list in Timothy of a list of qualifications for those who would qualify. With the idea that you need to be helpful to them, be responsible in meeting that need. And he told Timothy that if there are children in that family, it's their responsibility first. <clears throat> families take care of families. And then he suggested there's a qualification on the part of the widow. 
She must be a person, and there's a list of Christian activities that she needs to be a part of. And the word she's involved. She's an active Christian. And she's not a gossip. Stated very specific. So there's encouragement, there's warning. But the reason for the teaching is that the church needs to be aware of those in need. And those in need are widows and orphans. And so that's where this would come from. They would have understood that requirement. And they were not meeting that requirement. I don't know of any source that would tell us detail about what they did. All we see from the two, one is the rendering in the footnote, the other is the actual words in Mark's gospel. All we know is the end result that came about by their not mourning and providing comfort. It's just the opposite. We don't see how they did it. I don't know of any source that would give us an understanding of what they were doing with some specificity. But this is the summation. This is what was happening. Um, look at Luke chapter 2 and Bible in verse 36. It talks about, and there was one Alice, a prophetess, the daughter of Phileo of the tribe of Asher, and she was of a great age. Okay? And she lived most of seven years after her virginity. And she was a widow of about 48 years, which departed not out of the temple, but shared God fasting for us night and day. Sometimes we can get that back. Yeah. You know, the Old Testament gives us many, many examples of the proper actions toward people in need. Um, my brother, one of my younger brothers, is the administrative director of the Atlanta Inner City Ministry. And he'll be retiring next summer. And they just announced that one of the area-wide congregations has a minister that's willing to take over that administration. <coughs> For 20 plus years, Bo has gone to area churches of Christ and other agencies to provide for the inner city ministry. And the Lakeview Church of Christ is an inner city congregation. And he's a part of that and helps to raise funds for them. He has gone to some Atlanta congregations that are very large and very wealthy. And they have basically over many years said no. We're not going to help. And his response over the years, as patiently as he can be, but very frustrated eventually, <clears throat> is do you realize how many examples and commands we have in the Bible to tell us to be mindful of these people who are in special need? Inner city, homeless. At one point, AIM bought two homes and members helped them and they would provide short-time housing and help them to work to earn a little bit of money but mostly just give them a heads up give them a hand to maybe improve their circumstances i'm not going to tell all of his story because i wasn't well, it's just not a necessary comment, but it's a true comment of certain congregations and some of the answers that they gave. It's something we need to be involved in. When Jesus was dealing with circumstances in his personal life and helping people came up and someone appointing, anointing him with an expensive perfume, and Judas is carried, complained about it, wanting the money to be given to the poor. And of course, we find out from John's gospel 
that he was the money keeper and he was stealing from that money bag. But Jesus said, you will always have the poor with you. What she's doing is fitting. And isn't that true? Congregations will always have the poor among us. And is that one of the things we should be involved in? Yes. Evangelism, edification, and benevolence are the three pillars of a congregation, the stool, the legs of a stool, if you will. Evangelism, edification, and benevolence. All of those need to be a part of what we're about. Which one over the other? Circumstances would dictate that. But all three things need to be a part of who we are as congregations. And the principle, and be aware of widows and orphans. James says it outright. Timothy writes about it. Uh, Paul writes about it to Timothy. So that's part of who we are, part of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, the next one, Matthew 5, verse 5. The meek, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek. Uh, the word meek is a misunderstood word. It doesn't mean someone is weak. It doesn't mean they are easily stepped on, run over, if you will, to use uh, a statement that maybe rings in some circumstances. Moses was declared to be the meekest man in his time. And he was anything but weak. And he was very much a leader. Meekness has more to do with power or strength under control. The person who is meek may be an outstanding, powerful, charismatic leader. But the meekness helps him as a Christian leader to be under control not running over people, not taking charge, not the uh, benefactors Jesus instructed the disciples. Don't be like the Gentiles, they're benefactors. You be the servant, take the low place. Somebody that we call <coughs> doesn't remember when he was uh, with the Egyptians. Yeah. Somebody, one of the Egyptians was beaten on one of the slaves and he went out there and killed him. That doesn't sound like a big right. thing. And he thought he was doing something God would approve of. Right. And he was exiled for 40 years for doing it. Assuming to himself something he had not yet been called to do. Uh, but blessed is the meek. And he will inherit the earth. How do, how do you define that? He's going to be much appreciated <laughs> On this earth. He's going to accomplish much upon this earth. He's going to have a tremendous influence upon this earth. All of those things give us a picture, I think, of what's being said. The meek will inherit the earth. They will get so much done and people willing to work with them and so much accomplished is the best way I know how to explain it. But look at verse 15. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law, and that's the scribe, and you Pharisees, hypocrites, you cross land and sea to make one convert. And then you turn that person into twice the child of hell you yourselves are. Now what did he just call the scribes and Pharisees? Children of Satan. 
I couldn't say that. I wouldn't have the right, the, the full information, and as we suggested on Sunday night a few weeks ago, it's not time to make judgment. As far as we're concerned, the weed and the wheat parable. But he's saying, look at you. You work so hard and you're willing to travel from place to place, cross land and sea, to make a convert. And what were they being converted to? Not the law, not an understanding of the law, not a dedication to keeping the law, which is what they began as their main desire. But it deviated over years to where they were ignoring the commands of God and putting alongside oral teachings, man-made traditions. And so they would travel over land and sea to convert someone who would then be inundated with all their oral law and their traditions that were not commands of God. And I think we've talked about it once, the word work is the best example I've ever known of, been told of, uh, not to work on the Sabbath. And they came up with 213 definitions of work that let them do things that would not have been right if you keep the Sabbath. Remember we talked about it. Uh, just a few of them about a month ago as we started this day. You travel over land and sea and you then tell them about your traditions and your man-made mandates and you've made them twice the son of hell as you are. Now why would they be twice the children of Satan than the ones who led them there, who taught them those man-made traditions ignoring God's commands. Why would they be worse? Do you remember in 2 Peter 2, Peter talks about the reality that someone can fall from grace. And he said it would be better if they had not known the way of righteousness. And he makes a list to make it very clear that they had said no to grace that had left that life. And he says it's like a dog going back to the vomit. That person who leaves, it would be better for them not to have never heard and never responded to that. Why would that be the worst situation that they could be in? And it's what it says. Because once you leave God, there's nothing else. Once you dismiss grace, there's nothing else. Once you turn someone to your way of thinking and they're not going toward God's law, there's no one else they will listen to if they're convinced you are giving them the right answers. So they're worse off than you because they don't have any other way. In their mind, they have received what they need. And I think we all know people who it's hard for them to change their way of thinking. In some cases, I, I can't be baptized. I see what the scripture says. I believe in what it's saying. But if I'm immersed in water in order to have sins forgiven, what does that say about my family who died? And they were baptized. And they died in their sin. The best answer I've ever heard, given by a 92-year-old man to a young man, he says, if your mother was here today and heard what you heard, what would she do? And it took him two seconds to say she would be immersed in water. He says, let's do it. He said, okay. 
It's appointed unto man once to die, after that to judgment. So nothing he did could change what any relatives or friends may not have done and they may not have ever been properly taught. My prayer, as much as anything that I pray, is help them to hear the truth. Help them to hear the truth. And are you sure? Are you certain? That's what Don Blackwell spoke on last night at Beacon before I was went down to hear him. Had a great time, great singing, a good turnout for a Tuesday night, rainy night. But he said, can you be confident of your salvation? Changing the word slightly, but that's the message. And he preached from 1 John, which we've looked at in some form here already. We can have confidence, and for those who need confidence, we pray that they will hear the truth. And essentially, that's what Jesus is pointing out to the Pharisees. You travel land and sea, and they come to believe in you, and you turn that person into twice the children of hell that you are. They were lost prior, yeah. and they're lost again. And they're lost again, and what is that? False confidence. They think they're saved. When you think you're okay because you trusted someone, trusted a particular teaching, you're double condemned because you no longer, the implication will be open to what scripture would say, to what someone else would say. I pray often, help them to hear the truth. Let them hear the truth. And that's the assumption that they haven't. If they've heard the truth and not responded to it, God will deal with that. And there's not much we can do about it. Blessed are those who are meek, who will inherit the earth. And the scribes and the Pharisees, they were proud men who were sending souls to hell. Jesus' words, not mine. You're not helping them. You're creating a false hope. If you're not following scripture and you're following something different, Galatians 1, 8, 9 says, if someone were to preach another gospel than that which I preach to you, let them be eternally anathema, condemned. I say it once, now I say it again. If someone preaches a different gospel, let them be eternally condemned because you're giving false hope. They can say, well, brother, so-and-so told me this and I did what he taught me. And you're saying it's not the truth, it's false hope? Well, look at scripture. What does scripture say? It's, it's not us deciding what does scripture say. And uh, he's certainly pointing that out here. It's a very, very strong statement. God fearing, I'm going to read a comment in my notes. God fearing referred to Gentiles who followed the beliefs of Judaism. They didn't want to mix with the unclean Gentiles. But the Pharisees' zeal was real. They would go to Jewish communities and other lands, and in addition to handling legal matters and teaching, they would try to talk the God-fearers into undergoing the final rite of circumcision. And we see that in the book of Galatians. Leaving the freedom we have in Christ and demanding that Gentiles, in order to be acceptable had to be circumcised because of course that was the Jewish teaching and I can understand for a number of years how difficult it would be for Jewish Christians to leave what they had heard all of their life and knew had been taught for centuries through the prophets 
And suddenly something new was given to them that required them to make adjustments based upon New Testament teaching. The disciples, the apostles teaching. And um, Acts 15 deals with that. The Gentiles and Jewish Christians came together. James was there. Paul was there. Trying to figure out what can we do to where we can go in and worship with Gentiles. What is a requirement for us Jewish Christians to do to worship with Gentile Christians? And circumcision was always an issue of wanting to require it of the Gentiles. Did, uh, has a Gentile ever been given circumcision from God as a spiritual mandate or a biblical teaching? Yes. No. Circumcision of the heart. Well, circumcision of the heart, but the physical circumcision, exactly wrong. The circumcision of the heart, and it's the cutting of the heart that would lead to repentance. But the physical act of circumcision was never given to any Gentile. And so when you see in the New Testament that they're requiring it of Gentile Christians, it has a double element to it that's just completely false. But that's one of the issues that was part of the first century church of dealing with those things. I think I'm about to be run out. Thank you. Come back to Matthew 23. Turn to and mark one thousand sixteen. 1016, a song of encouragement. And before our devotional message, let's sing 948. 948. We're going to reverse the invitation message, if you will, because of what's being planned. 948, we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these I will learn my side. I will hasten to him, hasten to ride and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I 
I will come to thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one, he is the just one, he hath the words of life. So glad and free, Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter in. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. you have your song books, just turn over to 650. I just want to read you the first verse of this song. It'll set the stage for our topic tonight. The name of the song is Send the Light. And they got a little verse there. It says, it's in Acts chapter 16, verses 8 through 10. The main thought being concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And the first verse reads, there's a call comes ringing over the restless waves, send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light, the gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore forevermore is the second go around on that verse, but if you'll turn over to uh, Revelation, the 21st chapter, verses 23, and the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. All right, I'm going to flip over to Matthew, the fifth chapter, verses 15 and 16. Neither do men light a candle, put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it goeth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Uh, whenever we hear the term good news, what does that usually bring to your mind? Gospel. All right. We are commanded to spread the gospel throughout the world. All right. We're commanded to shine the gospel light to the world. If you will, let's turn over one more verse here. Uh, in, yes, in Mark, the fourth chapter, verse 21. Is a candle brought, bought excuse me, is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed and not to be set on a candlestick. We want our light to 